Okay. Well, welcome everyone to the uh, first session of the last day of this uh, this meeting. And our first speaker is William Slostra. William. So uh, thanks very much for having me. Uh, so I want to talk about operator solutions for linear systems mod P. Uh, this will be joint work with uh, Lu Ming Zhang. And uh, I'll make reference to some work with uh, Connor Paddock, Vincent Russo, and Turner Silverthorne as well. Um, what I want to talk about is kind of uh, more on the math side. Uh, actually, I, I kind of want to um, talk about some applications of what's called a small cancellation theory to linear systems mod P. And so I'm going to apologize, I guess, in advance that I'm not going to talk as much about the quantum applications. Uh, something had to get cut. But just to make sure that we're kind of all on the same page, let me start with at least something that I hope will be familiar to uh, most of us. So let me start with the merman Perez magic square. So of course, um, in, this, uh, in this scenario, we start with a three by three grid and we put variables from x1 up to x9 in this grid. And then we ask for an assignment of plus or minus one to the variables such that the product across rows is equal to one. And let's say the product across columns is equal to, uh, to minus one. And what we end up with is a linear system over Z2 with uh, nine variables and six equations. Um, and when we talk about the uh, assignment being plus or minus one and the product being uh, plus one or minus one, we've written the linear system multiplicatively. Um, but uh, we really get uh, a linear system over, over Z2. And a parity argument shows that the linear system has no solution. Basically, we, uh, we take the product of all the variables. If we think of it as the product of the rows, then we should get the product of the, uh, the row labels, which is one. But if we think of the product of all the variables as the product of the columns, then we should get the product of the column labels, which is minus one. So uh, we can't have minus one equal to one. But on the other hand, um, what we notice is that if we let x, y, and z be poly matrices, then we can assign operators to the variables x1 up to x9, uh, such that each operator is uh, a plus minus one valued observable. Uh, the observables in each row and column pairwise commute. And uh, the product of observables in each row is one. And then the product of observables in each column is minus one meaning now the identity matrix and minus the identity matrix. Uh, so I've shown uh, a potential assignment here uh, based on the poly operators. So we, we take a four by four matrices, uh, the poly uh, matrices being two by two matrices. So we get uh, four by four uh, observables here. Uh, and you can just check that, for instance, uh, in this column, if you take this observable and this observable, they're in the same column, so they commute. Uh, and X and Y anti-commute, so since we have um, you know, two x's here and two y's here, we get, two, uh, we get a commuting pair of observables. And, um, and the same thing happens in any uh, column, that any pair of observables will commute, and, the, and in any row, any pair of observables will commute. But then when we check the, uh, the products, we're gonna get one in every row and minus one in every column. Uh, so the result, um, if you, know this, and I know probably most of the people here do, uh, is that the assignment of these observables um, is contextual. So we can turn this into a, a contextuality scenario where um, it exhibits uh, state independent contextuality. Um, yeah. And I think, as I said, I apologize. That's really all I'm gonna say about the uh, the quantum mechanics because I want to talk about some math, but admitting that we are interested in things like contextuality, we look at this and go, that's great. Um, how can we get more examples of contextual operators like this? And of course, easy answer, let's just generalize this to ZP. So we could take a B to be E to the two pi I divided by P. And I'm switching up the labels a little bit here. Uh, if I wanted to be exactly analogous to what we just did, I would do one, one, one. But now, uh, and then B, B, B. But now let me do uh, 1, 1, B for the column labels. So what we can ask for is uh, an assignment of P roots uh, to each XI, such that the product across rows is one, uh, and the product across the first two columns is one, and the product across the last column is B. 
So now this is a linear system over ZP written multiplicatively. We still have nine variables and six equations. And the same argument as before shows that um, the product over uh, all the variables, uh, if there was a solution, would be the product over the row labels, that would be one. Whereas um, going to the, uh, to the columns, we would get the product over the column labels, which would be B. So since B is not equal to one, uh, the system has no solution. So all we need to do is find some satisfying assignment uh, in operators to this equation, and we would have some contextual operators. Um, so what do we mean by a satisfying assignment in operators? Well, we need uh, some unitaries uh, to assign to each one of these boxes, such that uh, xi to the p is equal to one. So these are uh, p outcome observables. And such that the unitaries in each row and column pairwise commute. So x1 commutes with x2, x1 commutes with x3, uh, x1 commutes with x4, and x1 commutes with x7. And the same with all kind of other uh, row and uh, column pairs. And then we want the product of the uh, observables across a row to be the identity matrix. Uh, and the same thing for the first two columns. And finally, we want the product over the last column to be uh, B times the uh, identity matrix. Now, um, while this is a great idea to try and figure out uh, a way of getting some set of contextual operators, it doesn't work. It's possible to show, and hopefully we'll get to it a little later, um, one argument for it, that such an assignment exists if and only if p is equal to two. So this idea, um, even though it kind of looks like, oh, this will obviously work, um, it doesn't work out. So um, I'm gonna come back to uh, linear systems mod p. But first, let me say, well, you know, we're disappointed. This didn't work out. What else can we look at? So let's look at a different type of generalization. We might say, well, we had uh, this linear system over C2. We had good luck with that. Why don't we look at other linear systems over C2? And so here's the type of setup. Um, suppose we have uh, an M by N linear system AX equals B over Z2. We say that an operator solution to this system is an assignment of uh, unitaries to, um, to variables, such that each unitary is a plus or minus one valued observable. That just means it's uh, square is the identity and it's unitary, of course. And such that if xj and xk belong to a common equation, i.e. If, uh, if their coefficients in the ith equation, let's say, is non-zero for some i, uh, then xj xk is equal to xk xj. And finally, if the, uh, the product of variables in the ith equation uh, to the aij, uh, these are all just either zero or one for a linear system over z2. So really this is just the product of the variables in the ith equation. This should be equal to minus one to the bi uh, for all uh, equations i. Um, so, this gives us a nice generalization of the merman paris square. And we can say that if this system does not have a solution over Z2, then any operator assignment or any operator solution like this, should really be a solution here, would give us a um, set of operators exhibiting the state independent contextuality. So fortunately, uh, there are many linear systems which, uh, which fall into this category. And we can actually get all kinds of interesting behavior from linear systems over Z2 like this. Uh, so for instance, um, if we want to make a distinction between finite dimensional and infinite dimensional operator solutions. So in this definition, I didn't make a distinction. Uh, all we need is these unitaries XI to be acting on some common Hilbert space. But uh, if we prefer to make sure that our Hilbert space is finite dimensional, then we can actually find lots of, uh, of systems AX equals B with no solution, but interesting finite dimensional operator solutions. So the merman paris square is just one of many uh, that fit into this category. Uh, we can also find systems with infinite dimensional operator solutions, but no finite dimensional operator solutions. And um, there's also a particularly nice class of, of systems that we can look at that give some interesting examples. And those are systems where each variable occurs in uh, exactly two equations. 
So really, there's no limit in, in, in this definition to the type of linear systems we can look at. But um, if we look at systems where each uh, variable occurs in exactly two equations, this, these are the systems where A is the uh, incidence matrix of a graph, um, in which case we can think of B as a, a Z2 vertex coloring. So I'll explain. We're going to be talking about this perspective for kind of the rest of the, um, the, uh, this talk um, about this graph theory kind of uh, point of view. So I'll, I'll explain more about this in a second. Um, but if we look at this class, then there's a nice criterion for telling whether or not um, there is uh, an operator solution. So let me explain a little more about these incident systems that come out of graphs. So uh, here's a nice graph, it's K33. I've uh, labeled the edges, so from one up to nine, um, and labeled the vertices with either zero or one. So in other words, what we're given here is a graph G and uh, a Z2 coloring of the vertices. And by coloring, I don't mean a proper coloring where uh, adjacent edges have to be different colors, although as a biocartite graph, I've actually assigned a, a proper coloring to these vertices, but we don't need that. It just, just be any function from vertices to Z2 when I talk about the coloring. Uh, so what is the linear system uh, with I, G, X equal to B? Well, this system has a variable uh, X, E for each edge of G and an equation for each vertex V of G. Uh, it's helpful to have the following notation to describe the uh, equation. So for a vertex V, let E of V be the set of edges incident to V. Then equation V states that, um, so the equation corresponding to vertex V, in other words, states that the sum of the edges incident to, uh, the sum of the variables X E for edges E incident to V is equal to B V, the color of V. So in other words, uh, let's say we pick this, uh, vertex up in the top left here. It's labeled by zero. So the corresponding equation would say that xe1 plus xe2 plus xe3 is, uh, is equal to zero. Uh, whereas if we did this equation, it would say that xe1 plus xe4 plus xe7 is equal to one. And you can actually check uh, here for K33, we've got uh, nine equations uh, sorry, nine variables and six equations. Um, and if we go back to merman Paris square, that's of course what we had here. And also in merman Paris square, um, each, uh, if you look at the equation for a row and the equation for a column, they have exactly one variable in common, no matter what row and column we pick. We picked um, second uh, row and first column, it's X4. Uh, second column would be X5. And for K33, that's exactly the property that uh, this system has. So uh, if I pick this equation on the top and this equation on the bottom, there's exactly one uh, edge in common, uh, E4. So this system uh, for the graph K33 is actually the merman perez magic square. So this, uh, this notion of these graph incident systems actually generalizes um, systems like the, the merman perez magic square. Uh, so what can we say about these incident systems? Well, there's a beautiful theorem of Dudarkopov that if G is a connected graph and B is some vertex coloring, then first of all, uh, the, um, the linear system, you know, I X equal to B has a solution over Z2, um, just a regular solution, if and only if the sum of the vertex labels or colors is uh, equal to zero in Z2. This is an interesting one. This is actually uh, quite easy to show. So um, here I've, I've done an even coloring. So I changed the last one to a zero so that the, uh, the sum over the entries now is equal to zero mod two. And we can see how we would find a solution to this, um, to this linear system. So we have to assign, uh, if we're thinking about it multiplicatively, we have to assign plus or minus one to each edge such that the product over, uh, let's say, E1, E2, and E3 is equal to one, that's one to the zero, whereas the product over E1, E4, and E7 would have to be minus one, uh, minus one to the one. Um, sorry, minus one to the zero up here. 
uh, and similarly for the other vertices. So we want to assign plus or minus one to each edge so that we get uh, one at, the product is one at these vertices and minus one at these vertices. So what we could do is we could put a minus one on this edge uh, and then a minus one on this edge. Uh, and then the, we'll get a minus, and then every other edge uh, plus one. So the product will give us a minus one here, a minus one here. Um, one's here since we have ones assigned to all these edges. And then at this vertex, the two minus ones will cancel out and we'll get back to a one. Uh, and in general, if we have a connected graph, what we can do is we can, um, and the sum of the uh, vertex colors is zero. We can pair up the, uh, the labels and then take a path between every pair of labels and, uh, and assign minus one to, uh, to each edge in the path connecting different labels. Actually, technically, we need to assign uh, minus one to the number of times an edge appears in some path. But uh, essentially, the, the point is that you can figure out what the edge label should be based on uh, paths you've chosen connecting or pairing up uh, different vertex colors. OK, so that's when this system has a, a classical solution. When does it have an operator solution? Well, this is the uh, really nice part of the theorem. So it has an operator solution. First of all, if, um, oh, excuse me, typo here. This should be the sum is uh, equal to zero. That's a big difference. OK, so if the sum is equal to zero, then we have a classical solution, and that counts as an operator solution. So that's one case. But if this sum is not equal to zero, uh, then we have an operator solution if and only if g is nonplanar. Um, and as part of the theorem, if an operator solution exists, it is finite dimensional as well. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting to look at this. First of all, that it's, it's really nice that it's non-planarity that comes out of this. And second of all, uh, part of what I find nice about this theorem is you think um, based on results like this um, where planarity comes up, at least that I, I've seen, you'd expect the theorem to read uh, it has an operator solution if and only if G is planar. It's not that often that something comes up where a property holds if and only if G is non-planar. Um, but that's the way it goes uh, in this case. Okay, so this is great. Uh, we failed in generalizing the magic square to mod P, but then we could do all these other generalizations by changing the linear system. But if we're kind of, um, we want to uh, cover all our, um, you know, we want to leave kind of no stone unturned. Um, we kind of have to think back to our original attempt to generalize the magic square and say, wait a second, we've got all these new examples, but there's still examples over Z2. Is it possible that we can actually find a, a, a linear system over ZP, which is class classically unsatisfiable, no solution, but which has an operator solution? Um, you know, can we, can we get contextual operators from one of these linear systems um, where the, uh, the operators have uh, P outcomes rather than just two outcomes? Uh, and the fact that it's been so difficult to come up with examples maybe makes us a little more curious. Um, so I can say, uh, you know, up, up until this point, no examples have been known. Uh, the only thing we've known is this theorem of Kassim and, and Wallman, um, which says that, uh, so if you remember, the magic square has a solution using two qubit poly operators. So we might think, well, you know, if we were going to make the magic square work, it would work with maybe uh, some number of, uh, say, um, generalized poly operators acting on uh, CP rather than, uh, rather than C2. But what they show is that for any odd number, uh, if you take a linear system AX equals B over ZD, uh, and if it has uh, an operator solution using N Q dit poly operators for some N, uh, that happens if and only if the system has a classical solution. So there's no way to get these kind of contextual operators uh, from a linear system using N Q dit poly operators. So something that kind of happens uh, in the um, 
in the Z2 case, oh, you know, I really should have put on this slide, I forgot about this, but now thinking about it as well, I should mention in Arkhipov's theorem, part of what makes this theorem tick, uh, we'll come back to this at the very end if we have time, is that, uh, so this is if and only if G is non-planar, which is if and only if G contains either K5 or K33. K33 is our magic square game and K5 is the magic pentagram. And in both of the case of K33 and K5, you have solutions using um, N qubit uh, poly operators. And you can show in this theorem, it's part of the proof of this theorem, that basically any, uh, if you look at, let's say G contains K33 as a minor, you can turn that into an operator solution for the system. So it will also have a solution using N uh, qubit uh, poly matrices. So for any one of these incident systems, they always have solutions like this. So this is maybe more powerful evidence than that something's kind of going on. It's actually a little more difficult to find um, kind of contextual operator solutions mod P. And I think we should be curious about that. It's really still not worked out exactly what's going on there. Um, so anyway, what I wanna show uh, or, or talk about in this talk is that there is a way to get linear systems that do have this behavior where they have uh, no classical solution, but do have uh, mod P operator solutions. Uh, so here's the framework. So we can actually even give uh, linear systems like this that come from the incidence matrices of graphs. Uh, we need to worry about now um, the, uh, so over Z2, you know, we take a, a linear system where the incidence matrix is always just zero or one but now we need to worry about signs. So um, rather than picking a graph, let's, let's pick a digraph. And uh, I wanna assume that this digraph is weakly connected, meaning that when you drop all the signs or directions on the edges, um, then it's connected, uh, it's, it's, it's connected as an undirected graph. So assuming we have a, a weakly connected digraph, let's define the signed incidence matrix of that graph to be the, um, the matrix with, uh, so rows in indexed by vertices and columns, columns indexed by edges. Um, and then we'll put uh, a one. So in a digraph, I've kind of just thrown some terminology in here without explaining it very much. Uh, and actually it doesn't matter exactly how you do this as long as you take this idea of, you've got a directed edge. And so uh, one of those um, directions is going to uh, like incoming edges are going to get one, let's say, and outgoing edges are going to get minus one. Um, so uh, indeed, so that's the, the schema I've put in here, but you don't have to use exactly this. Anything kind of following that idea can work. Um, so let's say, uh, but to explain the terminology anyway, um, we're in a digraph. Uh, every edge has a direction. So it has a, a source vertex and a target vertex. And so we're going to define our incidence matrix so that uh, the VE entry will be one if V is the target of E and minus one if V is the source of E and zero if it's not actually, uh, if E is not incident to V. Uh, and the reason for using this kind of sign convention is that it's, with this convention, it's still very easy to say when this, solu uh, this system has a solution over ZN uh, for working mod N. Oh, and I should say, uh, so these are defined as integers, but then I can think about it uh, uh, given uh, a function B from vertices to ZN, I can think about this as a system over ZN just by considering the reduction mod N for the integers. Um, so then this system will have a solution over ZN if and only if, uh, same criterion as before, the sum of the uh, vertex colors is equal to zero mod N. Um, and you show that in exactly the same way, using uh, paths connecting um, different uh, different labels. Um, although you can't pair up the labels now because they're not just either uh, zero or one, but uh, what you can do is kind of uh, move all the labels to a common vertex and then observe that uh, you're gonna have a solution if and only if that single vertex is colored uh, zero. Okay, so what can we show? We can show that there are examples of digraphs G and Z colorings B, so we can actually fix the, uh, the vertex labels ahead of time. Actually, um, this is kind of sounding overly complicated. Really, we can just pick a coloring where 
uh, we give all the vertices zero and one vertex a one, um, such that for every n greater than or equal to two, this system uh, does not have a solution mod n, but does have a mod n operator solution. So we can actually find uh, systems where you, know, you fix the graph g and color in ahead of time, and then this will work out for, uh, for every n uh, greater than or equal to two that we get a contextual operator assignment uh, to this system. Um, so what I wanna do for the rest of this talk is explain where this theorem comes from. And um, I know I already apologize that this is gonna be so mathematical, but I'm gonna apologize again. Um, and maybe this time the apology comes with an explanation that I think there's actually something to learn from the proof of this theorem that could be used in uh, other places in, uh, in studying uh, kind of contextual operators so I wanna explain a little bit of the ideas that go into this proof. And if, if um, kind of, uh, if we're willing to sweep enough details under the rug, we can actually give a, a complete proof of this theorem, I think in the time allotted for this talk. So let me first explain exactly what we mean by mod n operator solution. Um, so we've got a directed graph, we've got our uh, Zn coloring, let's say. Um, so we define a mod n operator solution to this. It's exactly what you'd expect. We need an assignment of unitaries for every edge, such that uh, they, uh, each of them is kind of an n outcome observable. So x e to the n is equal to one. And then for every uh, pair of edges incident to a common vertex, we want these unitaries to commute with each other. And then finally, we say that um, the linear system is satisfied, which we, uh, we write as the product over edges such that the source of, um, such that the target of the edge is equal to V times the product of the edges such, the, such that the source of the edge is equal to V of, uh, so that for when the target is equal to V, we take X E. And when the source is equal to V, we take, take uh, X E inverse. Uh, that should be equal to E to the two pi I over N to the B V. Uh, and this should hold for all V in the vertices. Now, the reason I wanted to write this out is to observe that actually looking at this, we should think about it as, um, well, these conditions look an awful lot like group relations. And so we maybe should re be rephrasing this in terms of um, kind of the representation theory of some group. So let's do that. So what we wanna do is um, take the, uh, so we start with exactly the same data and now we're gonna define a finally presented group. And what this means is we just write down some generators and then we write down some relations that these generators have to satisfy. And the only rule is, um, well, the relations all have to involve multiplication to be a group. And also we're not allowed to refer to scalars. And unfortunately we did have a scalar in here. So we need to introduce a special element uh, J, which will take the place of that scalar. So we're gonna take the finally presented group generated by variables X, E for edges E and uh, a special symbol J. To act like a scalar, we want J to be central. That means it should commute with each of the other um, variables X, E. And of course, uh, to be, act like E to the two pi I over N, we want J to the N to be equal to one. Um, and then we want these variables to satisfy all the relations that we wrote down for the observables. Uh, we want X, E to the N to be one. We want uh, if E and F are incident to a common vertex, then we want X, E, X, F to be X, F, X, E. And finally, for every uh, variable V, we want the product over uh, ed incoming edges of X E times outgoing edges of X E inverse to be J to the B V. Um, yeah, so maybe I should just leave this up for just a little bit longer. Oh, this is a good time to mention. Actually, it's a little late to mention, but I'll mention it now anyway, that if you'd like to follow along uh, and you've gotten lost and would like to go back in the slides and look at something, uh, you can find them on my website. So it's elliptic.space slash slides slash asqc2020.pdf. Uh, so you can follow along at home uh, and kind of go backwards and forwards. Um, okay, so we get this group, we call it gamma n g of b. Okay, so what can we say about this group? Um, well, uh, a mod n operator solution of the system is exactly the same thing as a representation of this group 
uh, call it phi, such that phi of j is equal to e to the 2 pi i over n. Uh, there's really no content in this statement because um, what a representation of a finally presented group is, is just an assignment of uh, operators on a Hilbert space to, or unitary operators on a Hilbert space to the variables such that all the relations hold. Uh, so a representation uh, with phi of j equal to e to pi over pi i over n is exactly the same thing as what we defined uh, an operator solution to be. Uh, there's some content in this statement here, though. Uh, this group has a representation if and only if the order of j is equal to n inside this group. Um, so the reason for that is that we can take uh, what's called the regular representation of this group if the order of j uh, is equal to n. And I should maybe remind you what the order is. So the order is the smallest number such that j to the n is equal to 1. So we've defined j to the, or uh, it's the smallest number m such that j to the m is equal to 1. We defined j to the uh, j such that j to the n is equal to 1. So what we're saying is that there's no smaller number m such that j to the m equals to 1. Um, and note that if p is prime, this is equivalent to saying that uh, j is not equal to the identity in this group. Um, yeah, yeah. so the reason this is true is, um, is that if we have, let's say, j not equal to the identity in the prime case, uh, we can take what's called the regular action of a group on itself, uh, and that will give us some unitaries acting on a Hilbert space, uh, not with phi j equal to e to the 2 pi i over n, though, but this element j is central, and it will have this as an eigenvalue. So if we restrict to that eigenspace of the operator, we'll end up with a, um, a representation with this property. Um, just starting from the fact that j is not equal to 1. OK, now one thing that's interesting about this definition that if, is that if um, we actually start with a vertex uh, labeling uh, into integers rather than into zn, then this definition makes sense, uh, except for all the relations where we said that um, you know, j to the n is equal to 1. It doesn't make sense to say, uh, sorry, I should say this, this definition makes sense if we take n to be plus infinity. Um, so it doesn't make sense to take j to the plus infinity, so we just drop all those relations. Those relations we count as, uh, as, uh, as unnecessary and, and remove them. Right? And then we, we actually get that like j has order um, infinity if there's no other relations. Um, let's, uh, let's say a priori j could have order infinity, let me put it that way. So it's like we get a linear system over uh, z. That's why we are taking n to be plus infinity. Um, so we can still talk about this group in this case, and we'll call it uh, gamma infinity of gb. So rephrasing the theorem I mentioned before, um, what it states is that there are connected digraphs g and uh, z coloring b such that, uh, first of all, the sum over the vertex labels is just one, um, which means that it won't have a solution in uh, mod n for any n, since uh, one is not equal to uh, zero mod n for any n greater than or equal to two. And second of all, such that the order of j is equal to n in this group gamma n for all n from two to plus infinity. We actually, uh, we actually get that the order of j is infinite in gamma infinity of, of gb. Uh, so this, uh, this theorem uh, saying that this, uh, we can actually put down graphs where they have mod n operator solutions for all n kind of holds in the strongest possible way. Uh, now, what this lemma is telling us then, that what we should care about if we want to try and prove this theorem or, or see the ideas in the proof is when does j to the k equal one in a group? And the answers, um, the first answer here, this is the answer in any finally presented group. It's when we can transform j to the k to one using the defining relations we wrote down. Uh, so that's the point of a finally presented group is that the, um, we don't put it down any relations except what's forced to uh, hold by the defining relations. So um, something is equal to uh, the identity if and only if we can actually make it be equal to the identity using the defining relations. And then um, something that also works for any group uh, is that the relations 
um, the, and by relations here now, I mean not the defining relations, but just all the relations that hold um, between different elements, they can be captured using what are called pitchers, uh, which is a, this is a longstanding idea that goes back to Van Kampen. So what I mean by pitchers, um, it's not just any drawing, but something very technical, uh, which is uh, the dual of a, what's called a Van Kampen diagram. So um, I am gonna try and define what a pitcher is for gamma and GB, but it's actually easiest to see what it is from an example. So let's consider the example of K33. I've tried to draw it in a special way here, which I may not have time to explain. Uh, well, I can explain the way I tried to draw it, but why I tried to draw it like this, I may not have time to explain. Um, I've tried to draw it with a minimal number of crossings. So if you set out to draw K33 in a planar fashion, um, you can get pretty far, but finally you'll have to cross an edge. Um, so that's what we've got going on here. But what I want to notice from this, uh, this drawing of K33 is I've labeled the uh, vertices in the top partition by A, B, and C, and vertices in the top and the bottom by a one, two, and three. And these two crossing edges I've labeled by uh, E and F. And uh, there wasn't room to put with the, uh, with the vertex labels here, there wasn't room to put in the coloring. So here's the coloring on the side. We'll label this vertex uh, one by, um, by one and uh, the vertex, uh, all the other vertices by zero. Oh yeah, so uh, these pictures, we're gonna use them for uh, kind of mod n, but they work for any, um, uh, sorry, we're gonna use the mod n, but let me do the example mod two. It's just be a little simpler. Um, okay, so I wanna write down a picture for K33 that shows that because we have this crossing here that uh, Xe and Xf uh, in, in this group gamma n um, actually uh, commute mod n, uh, sorry, anti-commute um, in the mod two group. And by anti-commute, what I mean is that um, Xe times Xf is equal to J Xf Xe. So here's how I'm gonna write down that picture. Um, so the picture will look like this. It's gonna be like a, a planar graph with no crossings allowed now. But, uh, and it's still gonna be a drawing of K33. So I've got in here um, all the vertices A, B, and, uh, and C, and, um, and one, two, and three. This isn't a vertex, that's just my bad drawing. Um, and of course, I have to have the edges, uh, at least one edge cross if it's, an, if it's a drawing of, um, one pair of edges cross if it's a drawing of uh, K33. But I'm gonna actually solve that problem a little differently. So now what's allowed is that edges can actually connect to a boundary. So there's a boundary on the picture and we can take the edges over to the boundary rather than having them go to um, an endpoint in the graph. So, uh, so the uh, edge E incident to A will connect to the boundary and similarly for the edge E incident to three and the same thing for, um, for F and uh, incident to two and to B. And now, how does this actually prove that Xe, Xf is equal to J, Xf, Xe in gamma two GB? Well, what we do is we read this picture uh, scanning from left to right. We should look on the left and say, oh, I've got uh, an edge Xe and then an edge Xf in the boundary here. So that's an Xe, Xf. And the picture will show us how to turn that into J, Xf, Xe um, by applying the relations. So what we do is we scan from left to right. And whenever we hit a vertex, we apply, so remember a vertex corresponds to a defining relation of our group. And so when we hit a vertex, we apply that defining relation. So uh, if I get to this point, I now have um, the edge, I didn't give it a label, but I have the edge connecting vertex A and vertex two, and the edge connecting A and one, and the edge connecting B and one, and the edge connecting B and three. And that's because what I can do is, when I get to A, I can change Xe to, um, the, so remember the, uh, the relation for A says that the product of these three edges is equal to the identity. And these um, all square to, uh, square to one. So that's the same thing as saying that Xe is equal to uh, the product of this edge and this edge. So when I get to this vertex, I can change this edge into the product of these two. And I can change Xf into the product of these two. And so now I would have instead of Xe, Xf, the product of these four, um, four edges. When I get to, uh, so now I, I got two from Xe and two from Xf. And then when I get to one, um, 
I have the two incoming uh, edges, the one that came from XE and one that came from XF. I combine them and I get a single output edge. Um, I also have to add in a copy of J because the relation for one was. Oh. Uh, and then I keep on scanning. Um, so now I would get these two edges. Um, so at this point, I just draw a vertical line. I can see I've got like the product of these three edges after go through, going through vertex one and a copy of J. Uh, and then I would combine. Um, so it's kind of annoying when you get to a, a vertically drawn line here. So what you should do is kind of jiggle these two vertices so that one comes first. And then you can cancel this one into these two edges and then cancel these two into that edge. And then these two edges would cancel to get XF. And finally, uh, after three here, we would have an XE. And reading, um, so uh, the way we've been reading this consistently is that we have an XF and then an XE. And that copy of J that we got from the one never went away. So what we have is J, XF, XE. Um, yeah, so the J comes from the fact that the vertex one occurs uh, just once. Now, of course, if we were applying a general um, kind of reduction from one word to another, uh, in this one, we use every relation exactly once, but there's nothing that says that um, we have to use every relation exactly once. So in general, a picture uh, is something like this, uh, a, a graph, a planar graph, and it's very important that it be planar. Um, so drawn inside a, a circle with uh, like a, inside a, a region with boundary, where we're allowed to connect some edges to the boundary and where um, every edge is labeled by an edge of G and every vertex is labeled by a vertex of G such that when we look at any vertex, the, uh, the, vertice, the edges incident to it are exactly the edges, the labels of the edges incident to it are exactly the labels of the edges incident to, um, to the vertex label inside G. Okay, so um, let's make this definition formal or maybe, um, maybe we shouldn't. So I'm going to, um, in the interest of time, maybe I'll just say there is a way to make this formal. Um, and if you're interested in this, uh, you've got the slides, so check this out. Uh, so all, these, all this says is what I mentioned um, just now. Uh, the key point is that if we're only worried about relations such that J to the K equals one, we don't actually need any of these boundary edges. So that's the key in this, um, in this definition here. So although in this picture we have these boundary edges, if we only care about what happens to J, we really are just caring about planar graphs with no boundary. Um, and second of all, I did the Z2 case, but in a general, um, in the gamma N case, we actually have to worry about inverses. And for that, we actually put directions on the edges. Um, and so we would read a, an incoming edge with a, uh, yeah, an incoming edge would be um, XF and an outgoing edge we would read as uh, the inverse of the edge. Um, or if we're cutting like vertically, we would take the direction that the edge crosses our vertical cut. Okay. Um, now I'm gonna mention something here, uh, so uh, which we might call the sine over Z2 and over Zn, maybe we'll call it the phase, which is that in this picture we had um, the vertices that we use from G are labeled by B. And that's how we figured out that this J got inserted. Um, the fact that one occurred once gave us a copy of J in this picture. And so uh, in general, what we can say is that uh, each edge that we use is gonna have a phase that corresponds to a copy of J to the K V, sorry, every vertex that we use, every relation that we use will have a, a correspond to a copy of uh, J to the K V for some integer K V. And then the sum of all these uh, phases will be the phase of the picture in total. And so um, what a closed picture will say is that J to the K equals one, um, so let's say we have a closed picture P of phase K, uh, that actually gives us a proof that J to the K equals one. And so it's this famous Van Kampen lemma that says that um, actually J to the K equals one if and only if there is a closed picture, the close is the no boundary edge part here, um, of this uh, group with, uh, with phase K. Uh, so what this means is that um, 
uh, well, we should do some examples of, of this in action. And the easiest place to do it is if we actually start with a planar graph. So um, let's say I start with a planar graph shown here, uh, the, the digraph. Uh, now I want to make a picture of the uh, gamma n g b for this particular g. And an easy way to make a picture of it, it is planar. Um, so it's a picture. I can just regard it as a picture itself. Uh, so um, the phase of the picture will be, because I've used every vertex exactly once, it'll just be uh, bu plus bv plus bw plus bx plus by. Uh, so in other words, the sum of the, um, the vertex labels. And so we see that if you have a planar graph uh, and k is the sum of the vertex labels, then j to the k equals 1 because of this Van Kampen lemma. So we actually get that in gamma n g b for, um, for a planar graph, the order of j will be equal to n uh, if and only if the sum of the vertex labels is equal to 0. Because if it's, uh, if it's not equal to 0 uh, mod n, then we would have j to the k equals 1 for uh, uh, some k uh, strictly less than n. Uh, William, do you mean yep. the order is equal to n or divided by n? Is it? A little bit uh, It'll actually be equal to n because in gamma n, uh, we define j to the n to be 1. So the order always has to, um, oh, I see. The order always has to divide n. Yeah. So what we're worried about is whether it could be equal to, um, whether we could have j to the k equal to 1 for k uh, different than n. Um, yeah. Um, OK, thank you. Yeah. OK, so we should see uh, some more examples of this in action. And actually, uh, we can kind of repeat this idea. We could say, well, OK, this worked great when g was planar. And another situation where we might be able to do the same thing is where uh, we have a planar cover of a graph. So what is a cover of a, of a graph? Well, again, I've got the formal definition here, but maybe I'll just show you in a picture. Um, here's a, a double cover of k33. So the idea is that for every vertex of k33, remember the vertices of k33 were um, a, b, c on top, and 1, 2, 3 on the bottom. So I've, uh, I've got a graph here now where I've got um, every vertex labeled by a vertex of k33, such that uh, every vertex label appears exactly twice. That makes it a double cover. Uh, so here are, is the uh, 1, 1, for instance. And such that, um, first of all, any edge in the cover uh, corresponds to an edge in k33. So I've got uh, 1a, 1c, and 1b. And if we look around any vertex, we'll see the same thing. Like, so for C, it's connected to um, 1, 2, and 3 here. And the other thing I need is that I need there to be a bijection between, for any vertex in the cover, I need there to be a bijection between the edges incident to, um, to, uh, to this vertex and the edges incident to the label in K33. So it's not just that uh, every edge here corresponds to an edge in K33, but that there's uh, exactly one edge incident to this vertex for every edge incident to one in K33. Um, and in general, we can have, uh, you know, um, L covers. So you can always show that in a cover, um, the number of vertex labels for each vertex is, uh, is kind of independent of each um, vertex in the base graph. Uh, so this is called the arity of the cover. And um, we call uh, an L, like a cover where the arity is L is called an L cover. So this would be a two cover of K33. Now it's not just a two cover, it's a planar two cover. This is a, a planar graph. So if we have a planar L cover, we can just turn that into a picture. So um, I haven't drawn any, you might say, well, what about the directions on the edges? But what we can do is just direct the edge. Like if, if, uh, if the edge in K33 was directed from three to C, then we could just do the same direction in the cover here. So we could just turn this into a picture of the group um, and what is the phase of this picture? Well, uh, every uh, vertex occurs uh, in this picture twice. So the phase would be the sum of the vertex labels times 2. And in general, for a, an L cover, the phase of the picture that we get would be L times the sum of the vertex labels, because every vertex occurs uh, L times. So if you have a planar L cover, um, and k is l times the sum of the vertex labels, 
then j to the k equals one uh, in this group. So this gives us a proof that, um, that, uh, that in the magic square game, we can't have mod n operator solutions because uh, this shows that in gamma n, we have, uh, if, we, if we do the coloring where we color one vertex one and every other vertex zero, um, so this sum would just be one. So we, we get j squared equals one in gamma n. So the only time we can have the order of j be equal to n is when n equals two. So, uh, so this double cover shows that there's no, um, there's no mod n operator solutions for n greater than two. Now, I think you wanted time for uh, questions, right? Yeah, um, yeah. I think so, we're so, just, yes. Yeah, so I've got, um, so what I wanted to tell you, I'm gonna take uh, maybe two more minutes if that's okay. Um, so what I wanted to tell you is that small cancellation um, actually allows us to prove that we can do these graphs with, uh, with um, where we do have mod n operator solutions. And so we've just got all the tools for me to tell you exactly the central idea in small cancellation. Um, so small cancellation is a way of showing a group is non-trivial if the relations don't overlap too much, uh, which is actually not really a very good <laughs> explanation of um, people always try and give, me included, I guess, this is one line attempt to explain what small cancellation means. It doesn't really do it justice. Um, but there's this kind of central idea in small cancellation, uh, which is the following famous fact that if we pick, for instance, let's say P equal to four, uh, should be PQ here, excuse me, PQ equal to four, four, let's say, uh, there is no planar graph in which every vertex has degree greater than or equal to four and, uh, and every cycle has length greater than or equal to four. If, you're, if you have a planar graph, then either there has to be a vertex with degree uh, less than four or a cycle with length less than four. Uh, in particular, there has to be a face with degree less than or equal, uh, less than four. Um, so what we can show is that if you have a, a picture of, um, of uh, gamma n g b for g, let's say being a graph which is say four regular and girth four, then um, then uh, if you have a picture of phase K, then there must be a picture P prime of, of the same phase, uh, which also has, um, well, let me get this right. So let's say we start with, uh, I feel like I kind of got bogged down in the details here. Let's say we start with a four regular graph of Earth four. Uh, and let's say we had a picture of phase K. Then what we can show is that there would have to be a picture of the same phase, which uh, is also um, a four, four graph. In other words, where every vertex has degree four and every, um, every cycle has length at least four. And of course, that's not possible. It's not possible to have a planar graph. Pictures have to be planar. So it's not possible to have a planar graph with that property. So um, if, we, uh, if we pick, um, four regular graph of girth four, we actually get no pictures at all, uh, just the empty picture. So in other words, there are no relations on J at all when you start with a, a four regular graph of girth four. Um, so that gives us the, uh, the proof of this theorem. There are a few open questions and I won't go through them now. Um, so I'll just mention the one that's on the slide. The theorem does not tell us that there are finite dimensional operator solutions. So that should give you a hint that, although I think uh, this is an interesting technique to show that, you know, the, the um, maybe this theorem is just kind of the first uh, start to say we should keep studying this. So it's not that there are never any uh, systems with, uh, you know, it's not that it's impossible to get mod n operator solutions for n greater than two. It is possible, but we really don't understand very much about the types of solutions that we get yet. Uh, we can't even tell if we get finite dimensional operator solutions. Um, so there's, I think, a lot more interesting stuff to do. So I'll stop there. Okay, thanks for the great talk. Um, so do we have questions? I guess there's the Q&A or... Uh... 
So, I mean, if I could just, uh, so in terms of, um, so you're relying on the fact that you can have graphs in all sizes that um, sort of use these small cancellation properties to show that you have solutions for all n. Is that right? Um, yeah, so it's actually not, uh, so you can get, I think, uh, k regular graphs of any girth. So it's yeah. not hard at all to find four regular graphs of girth four or three regular graphs of girth six. Um, yeah, there's, uh, there's lots of them, essentially. Okay, uh, maybe we can take uh, further questions in the discussion, just not to defer Ingemar's talk, uh, if you like. I also have a question, but uh, maybe it might take longer. <laughs> it's a very interesting talk, thank you. Okay, so we proceed. Okay, so our next 